Hello, listeners. It's the Turn and Turn podcast where we talk all things agriculture, maybe a few other notable topics. Uh, I'm your host, John Mazer. This episode is powered by Mazer Group. Uh, we're a family owned and operated New Holland dealer complex across Saskatchewan and Manitoba with 18 locations. We are recording live out of our Regina location today. I work out of here. I'm the director of sales for uh, all of Saskatchewan stores. And today we are joined by one of our biggest customers, Mr. Jordan Cambites. Jordan, thanks for joining us. Welcome. Thanks for having me, John. Yes. It's always a pleasure seeing you uh, in professional times and in personal times. Absolutely. We'll call this a little bit a mixture of a both. You bet. Right on. Uh, I've given a little brief explanation of Mazer Group. Can you tell us, give us a little snapshot on KF Farms? Yeah, KF Cambites Farms uh, homesteaded 1899. My great grandfather, uh, just north of the town of Sedley, about 25 minutes from here. Um, yeah, I'm the fifth generation. The farm's gone through lots of changes over the years, most notably the last 15 years, I'd say. Um, we started on a growth trajectory um, that hasn't stopped here. We've been continuing to grow and expand our footprint in the southeast here, part of the province. And primary um, crops that we grow are canola, um, lentils, chickpeas, durum, a little bit of barley, and some spring wheat. Nice. So fifth generation. I'm actually, you one bet. thing I forgot to mention, I'm third generation. So we're awesome. Yeah, carrying on the business, which is fantastic. Um, we're coming up on plant 23 here. So if you could take us through uh, equipment involved in Plant 23, uh, you're a loyal New Holland customer, so we got to plug this a little bit here. Yeah. But equipment involved in plant spraying and ultimately harvest. Yeah, we're just um, in the middle of our preseason uh, ready checks on all our drills and tractors. Um, so we would run um, multiple T9 645s, uh, smart track units. And we're pulling uh, 86 foot Borgo drills with 1300 bushel carts this year. And um, we're trying to do about eight to 9,000 acres per drill. So we, we target about 100 acres per foot of drill. And that involves um, having to run 24 hour shifts as the season progresses to allow us to get the crop in in a timely manner. Looks like this year we're going to be a little delayed start. I'm looking out the window here today and it's still white across the the countryside here. Uh, the forecast looks beautiful though. Plus 19 I see on Tuesday. Um, I think it's going to change quick. The ground doesn't have a lot of frost in it. It's quite dry. So hopefully it sponges up some of this moisture. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm with you on the weather. Like, cause I mean, it, we had, to, we were, what's the word I'm looking for? We were blessed with like a pretty mild winter here and typically like they're out of control cold, but I mean, January was lovely and uh, February was okay, but had some crazy cold days in March and then leading into April, like and it was minus 26 this morning mm -hmm. and it's April mm -hmm. 6th. Like, it's, yeah, it's wild. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. Unusual. For Absolutely sure. crazy. Yeah. So, um, okay. So that's seeding, uh, spraying. We've got six in the field. Yeah, we run six SP410 Fs, uh, so it's the front boom, uh, the biggest offering from New Holland, the yep. 135 foot with 1,600 gallons. We just love the front boom sprayers, um, and so we're looking forward to uh, pairing those up. We run three water trailers to service the six units, and then uh, we complement that once we hit fungicide season and pre-harvest season with uh, some aerial spray. You do, yeah. And yeah. do you have a plane, correct? Yeah, we um, partnered with a few other operators and yep. we have a fleet of airplanes that we can deploy and move around to um, different parts of the province here based on how the needs are. Oh, good stuff. Yeah. Right on. Uh, now moving into harvest. Yeah, harvest. Um, it's funny, you know, harvest isn't too far away. We haven't even put the crop in yet, but in whatever, four or five months here, we'll be rocking and rolling in the uh, field with the combines. Um so we split our fleet into two to calm things down a little bit and try and optimize and get some more efficiencies. And we're running uh, two groups of eight this year. So we're running 16 uh, CR990s this year, 45-foot uh, Macdon heads. Um, par part of them, I think, will be the New Holland branded Macdons, which yep. we're looking forward to. And... Um, and then uh, we complement that with, um, depending on what crop types and what our yields are like, whether we go to five or six grain carts, and we uh, have those paired up to T9 645s as well. Right on. Yeah. It's a lot of serial numbers in the field, which is awesome. 
It is. Yeah. yeah. You know, but it, it's part of, um, dealing with a dealership group like you guys that have a good footprint. Um, we, you guys constantly have what we need and what we're looking for. And so if we need to upsize, uh, short notice, um, if we got major mechanical down downtime, things like that, you guys are there to support us and you have the depth in your network to yeah. be able to find what we need. So it's, it's been a great relationship that way. It has. Yeah. Very transparent relationship. And we're actually testing some new service models this year, which is really exciting. And, uh, we'll get into those maybe later on in the year, mm -hmm. not saying too much right now. So, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of equipment mentioned there, um, staffing wise, obviously you have some staff that you keep year around. You probably got some seasonal staff. Um, yeah, take me through kind of the, the core people of, of KF and then, and what you do for, for hiring as far as, you know, filling the seats in, in those seasons. Yeah, I think as the industry's evolved, we've been able to offer more career type positions. We have guys um, that are coming from different sectors. Some have ag backgrounds, some don't. But um, what we've been able to provide is a platform for guys to uh, see progression within the industry. And, and often we're able to provide comparable wages and, and salaries to some of the other professional industries. So um, we deploy up to 30 people in our peak season and um, in the winter season we're probably running at about 16 to 18 mm -hmm. and then we you know like I said in the springtime here <clears throat> some guys have already started but most of our seasonal staff will start in the next week or two and um, they'll they'll slowly start trickling in um, and we like to be at full roster by the time the drills hit the field. And that's full roster for the entire year. It'll be full roster right to the end of yep. October, Sorry, early yeah, November, yeah, 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 the end of the season. And then um, at that point, some of the seasonal guys are either uh, existing retired farmers. We have some school teachers. We have some seasonal guys that are uh, cattle ranchers, and they need to get back to their own operations. Yeah. So it really works well and um, allows us to balance our workload and, and create an environment that's super efficient. Yeah. Right on. Uh, in the office there, we've got Tammy, the gatekeeper, who's an mm -hmm. absolute beauty. Um, uh, Jason Mahar, obviously your brother-in-law, is yep. involved. And uh, Pops has got an office there too as well. You bet. Is yeah. he involved in any of the any of the the like the, the farming stuff or is he off doing his own thing? No, he's off doing his own thing. Yeah. We talk strategic high level uh, yep. once in a while. He pops out here and there. Um but uh, more so, he's a sounding board for yeah. for some ideas and uh, some some of the pie in the sky discussion. Um, you know, one notable person in the office that that we really have grown fond to is Terry. She's a cook for us, and she comes out every Monday and uh, cooks for our office staff. And often she test drives new recipes and whatnot for the seasonal staff. So. Um, we're really excited about that. We've been honing in on some new chocolate chip cookie recipes and, and some new lentil soup recipes. So it's, it's pretty fun there in the winter time. And, and then as uh, spring rolls around, she cooks for 30 every single day and we deliver a hot meal uh, to every single person on the operation, no matter where they are, right, right yeah. to them in the field. So it's part of our, um, you know, bringing back some of the fa family values and, and still holding true to the, to the history of our, uh, you know, the generations before us. Yeah. Yeah. Good stuff. Yeah. And I mean, yeah. Inspiration to maybe get a cook on stuff here at Mazer group, you know, but <laughs> at, at the same time, how many chocolate chip cookies would I go through <laughs> if there was somebody baking them fresh here it's every tough. day? Yeah. yeah. The smell coming out of that. Yeah. We yeah. all know how it goes. So uh, you mentioned a bit of the history of, uh, of KF, you know, going back to 1899. Uh, tell me about Jordan's history. You know, obviously you went to school here, um, high yeah. school and then yeah, into, uh, grew up in Regina, um, you know, only lived about 25 minutes from the farm. So was closely rooted in the operation, uh, through the summertime, uh, growing up farming wasn't very sexy. And, uh, yeah. I was really urged to continue my education after high school. I stayed in Regina, um, went to U of R, did six years at U of R, um, got a degree in uh, business administration and finance. And then uh, I continued that and got a degree in um, bachelor of arts and economics out of Regina. And then through that was working some summer, uh, what you'd call them co-op terms at Farm Credit Canada and continued on after for a little while at Farm Credit after I'd graduated and then moved on to working at Agriculture Canada on some of their ad hoc um, programs that they were rolling out. And that provided a really good background to understand the other side of farming. 
and it really provided some insight on what was working and what wasn't working um, in the industry. And through that period, I started to get some confidence in what I wanted the future and then and the model to look like for my generation, and slowly started deploying that. So. Fast forward a few more years, uh, left the workforce and, and jumped in full time into farming. And, and here we are today. Yeah. The rest is history, as they say. Yeah. So during those days in at FCC or uh, Farm Credit Canada, was there, was, was the farm in operation at that point? Were you renting land out or, or was it always going? Yeah, no. Um, during that period, uh, my dad and uncle were um, involved in agribusiness outside of the farm and um, were renting the majority of the farm out. I was managing the grass portion of our farm. So we have some of our marginal land. We were rotating through um, both a hay program and a rotational grazing program. So I was managing that. And then um, we were getting lots of custom farming done. And then I slowly started to build up my own fleet of equipment and eventually bought out my uncle and um, went full, full bore. And at that time, you know, was really buying equipment that whatever worked, whatever was the best deal at the time. And I didn't realize the power of aligning myself with a single brand and a dealership group and made the choice to uh, partner up with Marcus in New Holland at the time. And we believed in the brand and more importantly, the family. And uh, we shared some similar goals and visions about where we wanted to be in the future. And, and that led us down the New Holland path and eventually led to the, the meeting of Mazer and KF. Yeah which is a blessing for us because it's been awesome. So yeah, Both ways, yeah, yeah these, uh, why well, it's been, it was, uh, February 1st of 2019 where, where the, uh, the floor mats were changed out, but basically nothing was changed here at the dealerships from a personnel standpoint. We've got so many great people here from, from the previous ownership. And I got to plug, I got to plug, uh, you know, Hartley, Derek and Corey for the job that they did before, um, for a single store, like an unbelievable job. They looked after their customers. And I think that comes naturally from a family owned and operated businesses. And that's exactly what Mazer Group is, right? So, Absolutely. Um, so yeah, and we share the same, uh, same values and goals. And, and uh, yeah, so it was a perfect fit for, for the Marcusons and a perfect fit for KF. So it's mm-hmm. uh yeah it's been uh it's been amazing that's for sure um talking about the farm um there's different legs of the farm and i don't want to uh, you can get as deep or as shallow as you want but i know you know the farming obviously is the core operation we've got uh you know so you've got a marketing division is there anything else other than that involved in that because i mean HQ, if anybody's been by it, our listeners have been by it, you know, it's massive, you know, there's mm-hmm. a massive grain facility out there. And uh, yeah, so just touch on, you know, what other operations are involved out there? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we're involved in a lot of different agribusinesses. Our primary, um, our primary uh, business is the farm. That's where my heart and soul lie. And Um, But we really noticed the need over the years to continue to vertically integrate our operation through the agribusiness value sector. And, um, you know, we saw value add propositions coming and going and and really the future of domestic processing in in the province and really wanted to participate in that. So we do have an ingredients and and marketing uh, company we have um, we own and operate uh, several fertilizer sheds for ADM which has been a, a great relationship so we have the ability to um, manage the the inflow and outflow of fertilizer through our site there um, we've invested in uh, significant rail infrastructure right at our yard which has really helped for us um, in direct marketing um, We've taken some of our marginal land and developed in some aggregate resources. So we have a, a gravel business that is uh, both open to the public and also helps support our ongoing projects that we're working on, whether it's bin projects, road building, yard sites, that sort of stuff. But ultimately, our, our primary focus is the farm. And I have a strong belief in the future of ag and, and really trying to set this up for the next generation. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you're literally utilizing every single acre that you have when you talk about, you know, getting in the aggregate sector, you know, that's absolutely. marginal land, not being able to farm, you know, there is yeah. something below the surface there. That's a value to somebody, right? That's right. Yeah. 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 Good yeah. stuff. Good yeah. stuff. So, um, what did I want to ask you next? Um, you know, you, your operations got to a point, Jordan, where like, I mean, the size of it is, is uh, you know, it's it was, 
I'm not going to say it was a shock to Mazer Group, but I mean, you know, the operation of your size is is not really known or seen in Manitoba. You know, like we, uh, Mazer Group really operates around, you know, the five, 10,000 acre mark. There's a few bigger than that, but generally that's the typical size. So, mm-hmm. you know, you're on a growth strategy since you got into it that's really been successful for you and, and the growth of your farm. So what are, if you could name a few, what are the what are the biggest keys to success in order to be able to do that? Like, obviously you had a plan laid out or maybe you didn't, maybe you were just winging it, but you strike me as the type of guy that had a plan. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what are the kind of the main stepping stones to get to the growth that you've had? Yeah, there's a lot of key pieces to the growth model. And I think I'd have a different answer depending on what year you talked to me about, but reflecting back, um, it's really for me has been about the people. And it's surrounding myself with the right people and good people. And that's both internally and externally partnerships at the banking level, at the accounting level, at the legal level, at the realtor level, at the dealership level and the manufacturer level. Those are the key uh, relationships that we need to continue to align ourselves with to have continued success, shared visions, goals, and transparency. And I think then the results start to speak for themselves. Um, having a clear, clear understanding on what your, what your, um, goal is, what, what path you have to take to get there, having all your, uh, financial side in place, having your agronomy plan in check. Um, you know, and I think ultimately we're quite fortunate where, where our ancestors landed. We're in a area that's, it's a prolific growing zone. We can grow a lot of different crops. Um, We've been relatively impervious to the droughts. Um, We haven't been super susceptible to the flooding years. So we've been really fortunate where we are. And um, I attribute that just to the the good luck of where my ancestors settled in 1899. But ultimately, it's been a lot of hard work, um, but it doesn't come um, without a, a strong vision and aligning yourself with good people. Yeah. The ancestors picked the right spot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and I mean, uh, you know, your pops when we get on get them on here, I, like uh, there was a whole system of you know how when when you know our ancestors immigrated on how you know the land was plotted to them, and I don't know if it cost any money or, or how that works, and we'll get we'll go into that deeper on another episode. But yeah, really interesting how they they picked here. You know, it's in the middle of middle mm-hmm. nowhere, really, and yeah. this you know it's I mean as flat as flat can be for miles, but it's like ideal. And perfect ground for what we do, it is, and, and the business yeah. that we're in. So, yeah. so to flip it on, uh, to flip the topic from uh, points of success and and keys to success. What do you see as the biggest challenges within the industry right now? There's lots of challenges. I think as um, we've seen over the last few years here, the geopolitical and policy risk. I think is one of the bigger things that's emerging. Um, there's always going to be the constant struggles of whether it's weather risk or um, HR management issues, things like that. Um, but ultimately, it's the things that are out of our control that, that um, I think is emerging to be a real threat going forward. There's been a lot of policy direction and discussion coming out of Ottawa as an example, and even on a global stage that is is troubling to me in, in some regards where our message is not being told by a unified producer group that is pulling in the same direction. I think we're often seeing issues where our message is being told for us and it may not be the right message. And ultimately that's going to transcend into policy issues coming down at a government level that may or may not be uh, positive for us. So um, that's something we're keeping our eye on and and trying to understand the pulse of that as it emerges and how it's going to impact us and, you know, what we have to do as an operation to shift and pivot to try and stay ahead of that. Yeah. So what is the message then, if I could put you on the spot, what is the message that needs to be, that needs to be said? Well, I think ultimately we need to have a unified message, um, and, and show the world and, and even at a local level, right from the grassroots education level in our school systems on actually who we are, what we're doing, how good of stewards we are for the land and the environment and really share the fact that we're growing food in a sustainable, um, environmentally friendly manner yep. that not only benefits us, but benefits the rest of the people that are, that ultimately are our consumers. We're not depleting oceans over here. We're, we're growing, exactly. as you said, sustainable crops that, that feed the world. And literally yeah. we're feeding the world from here in literally. Regina, Saskatchewan. Yeah. yeah. Like, yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if you probably know the trail of when you're 
product leaves your yard there and goes out to the west coast or it goes south but i mean yep. it's literally all over the world mm -hmm. which is which is uh it's really interesting to think about that it is yeah. from our little town of not really so little but regina saskatchewan and yep. it's reaching all corners of the earth so yeah um you mentioned technology in that. I know when we came to when we came to Regina, technology was just something. I mean, we were involved, but not to the extent that we're involved at this point right now. When we're talking, when we moved here in uh, four years ago, um, because Mazer Group was really good at uh, proving our equipment by mechanics. We would go in the field, we would drop pans, we would prove combines can do what they do. Um, but it's just a different story out here. And, and you know, that mainly has to do with the size of the farm and, you know, how much data like you're pulling off of broad acres that you do yourself. How important is technology to KF? Technology is everything. I think that's what's going to really shift us into the next generation of farming here. Um, the mechanical side of, of the industry, you know, whether it be horsepower, hydraulic capacity, things like that on the equipment, it's naturally getting better. I mean, all these uh, manufacturers, they're first and foremost equipment companies. They're, they cut their teeth on engineering and fabrication and the design on how to build machines that do things better in the field. But ultimately now, they, you know, we're we're looking at these sectors and saying, you know, how can we really merge the technology side to the mechanical and the manufacturing side and, and create a really harmonious relationship where we have results that are measurable, um, they're real time, and we can make decisions that are impactful for our business immediately. Typically, we were always working in arrears with information, and it was always reactive and never proactive. And so we're looking at, you know, how can we work real time, make impactful decisions that are both going to benefit our financial statements and also benefit our land. Yeah, so important, especially for, uh, I keep saying an operation your size, but I mean, like, it's really something pretty fresh to us, you know, can, uh, considered, you know, we've been in, you know, Mazer Group or Mazer Implements or however far you want to go back is 1959. Again, it's all been mechanics, but to get to an operation your size and, you know, you, you know, to use your uh, reference back at the start that you've got 16 combines in the field to see that real time data coming in and managing those 16 combines because 16 combines have 16 different operators yeah. and some are very experienced and some are, you know, not so experienced. They're still good operators, but just have, don't have the, you know, the old school know-how that some of the older operators do. Right. So to see that data in real time and tell them to, you know, make a little bit of a change here, you know, change this over a little bit can mean, you know, bushels at yeah. the end of the day, you know? Absolutely. So yeah, it's, uh, it's something that we're obviously diving into as head first as, as much as we can. And uh, I think that's what Mazer Group values to the KF relationship the most is how transparent we're able to be with you guys in that, you know, from beta testers to, for, to from different equipment to, you know, uh, you know, liaisons to New Holland be that, you know, just giving them information on how their product works and what they can do better. So I think New Holland's very grateful and we're certainly very grateful. So it's a good, it's a great relationship. It truly is. Yeah. 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 Personally and professionally. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Right on. Uh, what's the future got in store for Jordan and KF? I mean, you're obviously on a, on a, great growth strategy. I mean, you're, you're, you're pushing the right buttons. And, uh, so what does the future hold? What is what does a year down the road look like? And what does five years look like? Yeah, we're going to continue doing what we're doing here. We're having a lot of fun first and yeah. foremost, I think. Um, and that's what makes it enjoyable to come to work every day. We, you know, we truly believe, um, in creating a, an atmosphere where we have an opportunity to learn every day, not only learn from our staff and, and some of our colleagues in the industry, but the challenges of the day, they're constantly, um, becoming upfront and, you know, where, where I get excited is coming to work and solving those challenges. So until that loses its fun and luster, um, yeah. I'm having fun. So we're going to continue to, uh, to grow our business. Um, you know, and for us, we're measuring growth in more than just acres. We're working on, you know, how we can um, have a better environmental footprint, how we can continue to build the health of our soils, our financial statements, and ultimately um, drive our bottom line in a sustainable manner. So those are all the challenges of growth that we look at. Um, you know, and, and I can't help but look at the next generation. You know, I have, a, I have some kids at home that may or may not be interested in ag going forward in a big way. And, and we'll see when that day comes. But 
at least set this up to have the platform for that to continue into generation six. And, and I think we're also, you know, continuing to have fun expanding some of our peripheral businesses that are involved in, in ag and, um, and, uh, the, the industry it's, it's got a lot of fruits to bear still. I think where we are in Regina here is really the home of, of Western Canadian ag and there's just a ton of opportunity. Yep. So at the, at the end of the day, you're just going to keep waking up and, and, um, keep focused on what we're doing and, uh, looking forward to what the future brings. I think there's going to be a, some new technology coming down the pipeline here soon. That's going to be exciting and we're constantly seeing, um, new genetics coming down the pipeline, new chemistries, things like that. So, um, it's exciting space and I get to hang out with a lot of cool people. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, uh, it's, it's yeah, great. Good, good people. It's, it, and it is, it is an industry that's fun. You know, like, I mean, it's, uh, you know, we had a conversation, I, I, I'm not sure when it was, but you know, our, our one shot at our cycle, you know, every year. And so, you know, speaking of, you may only have 30 cycles left or 25 cycle cycles left, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, as long as you said, use your words to keep it fun. I think that's what the, you know, that's what's paramount to it all, right? Yeah, it's unique. And yeah, yeah. you talk about business cycles. I talk about it all the time. And, you know, I don't know, is it 15, 20, 25? Yeah. We have one crack at it a year. Um, so I think that's where the rush comes from getting it right. You got one chance. Yeah, that's right. So, so speaking about future too, and, you know, our next generation is, and I think about this all the time, is our next generation going to see equipment that doesn't require drivers or is that totally autonomous? Because, I mean, every manufacturer is, you know, boasting that they're going towards that. Me personally, like, I always think there will be a human element to farming, like mm -hmm. whether where it's five years down the road or it's 30 years down the road. Um, there's so many variables in what we do, you know, I mean, we're ground penetrating, we're, you know, like in, 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 um, uh, in harvest where there's a lot of moving parts in a combine, mm -hmm. a lot that can go wrong. So, you know, what's your view on that? Like, I mean, can you see there being an autonomous farm or is it? Absolutely. I yeah. think it's gonna, it's the, the natural progression is there. Um, whether it's semi-autonomy or full autonomy, I don't know. Um, and I don't know how quick it's coming, but I think there's certainly a home for it at some capacity. Um, we're seeing instances on large scale where, where we think autonomy, um, would have a lot of value. Do I think there's still going to be the human element? Absolutely. I don't know, you know, it is, it does that mean you have the human element still in the field or is it, um, a group of experts in a, in a room monitoring screens? Not sure what that looks like, um, but we're ready to embrace it and whatever that, that does look like and whenever it comes, we'll be ready for it. Um, but I, I think it's still a ways away um, and whatever the final solution is, there's going to be a bit of a bridge period as well. And, and um, certainly seeing some of the manufacturers trying to figure out what that solution and what that bridge looks like. Um, but it's, it's an ever, um, you know, I think it's, it's an ever increasing topic of discussion along with, you know, what is the future of the combustion, combustion engine, electric over diesel, things like that. So it's exciting, I guess, yeah. more than anything, I'm excited to see what that future looks like. And, you know, historically we change was not welcomed in agriculture and, but change is happening so quick and technology is advancing on such a exponential level that, um, we got to stay current and modern to be relevant in this space. Yeah. So, and yeah, we have very to, welcome. Yeah. They're, uh, along with that and embracing and embracing the autonomy when it does come as, I mean, we're also putting a lot of trust in that equipment too. You know, like, I mean, there's nobody you can remount at the end of the day, if something should go wrong that, I mean, like, you know, maybe could have been avoided. So yeah. yeah like, I mean, I'm with you. Like, I mean, the, the whole testing it and seeing what comes out and like, I mean, nothing's going to change by next year. Right. Like, I mean, we're still going to run right. the same operation, but yep. at the same time, you know, like the manufacturer could put something out. Well, okay. We can maybe test that model in a little corner of the yard here or the field or whatever and just see how that goes so for sure it's uh yeah i am again i agree with you and and that's my view as well is that there will always be a human element and and uh yeah until we can put full trust in a piece of equipment that can drive itself let's just keep having fun that's right yeah absolutely yeah I'm going to change it up on you a bit here. We're going to get into oh some boy. fun stuff. Well, it's nothing too crazy to start, and then we'll get into some opinion stuff. But yeah, yeah. just circle back to, um, you mentioned, Terry, you're in the kitchen out there. Yes. What's the favorite in-field meal for Jordan? 
Mine is uh, a baked ham with scalloped potatoes, and she's got a bit of a kind of a honey mustard glaze on the ham. Yeah. And um, yeah, the the creamy scalloped potatoes, and then typically I think there's peas in there, some uh, some garden peas mixed in there, and then um, a nice cold can of Coke. Bottle, Glass of champagne, right? Bottle of water, and for dessert, she makes a killer apple crisp. Oh, is that right? Yeah, so that's... Apple uh, crisp. You had yeah. me at mustard. As soon as you said mustard, and like, I'm a huge mustard guy, so honey mustard, anything like that. So yeah. on a little bit of scalloped potato, sounds like it would just hit the spot. And nothing like having it warm and delivered right, right? to your call mine. So exactly, right yeah. Right to your tractor, sprayer, it's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah. 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 And there was a, we had talked about this and we had talked about this before, but there was a, there was a menu at, so at one point that involved like 20 items and you yeah. guys slowly narrowed it down to yeah. maybe five or six, I think it is. Yeah, I think yeah. we got maybe six or seven on a rotating basis and uh, it took us years to whittle the menu down to what worked for everyone. We have a few people, um, you know, that need uh, gluten-free options as well. So we've yeah. been able to cater and develop a menu that's, that's awesome and works for everyone. And, um. Yeah, it's definitely the highlight of the day for sure. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. and the cookies that you smell that yeah. cooking every day. Yeah, oh, right on. I'm pulling my phone out here because I had one of our friends send me a list of restaurants in Regina. So we're gonna play a little okay. game here. Yeah, and you're gonna rank these. Now I'm gonna say them one at a time, but you have and there's five restaurants, therefore five rankings. One being your the best, and and five not saying the worst, but your fifth pick. We'll call it. And you, I'm going to give them one at a time, and you have to allot them. So if you pick the first one that I say and you put it in the second spot, the second ranking is taken. Mm-hmm. Follow? Follow. Okay. Let me pull this up here. Zam Zam. Three. I've never been. Have you? Yeah, a few okay. times. Yeah. yeah. And it's a three. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Milu. Sorry, one's best or five's best? One's best. So in that one's case, best. it doesn't matter, Jordan, because you're right, yeah. you ranked yeah, the three, I picked, I picked so the it's right bat. in the middle. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, is it M- Milu? Milu's got to be a two, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So two and three are taken. Yeah. Ginger garlic. Oh, that's one. Really? Yeah. Okay. I don't even know what the next two are, but okay. yeah, that's So one. one through three are taken. Unfortunately, okay. yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. Agave. Uh, five. Five? Have you yeah, been? I have, yeah. yeah I all, haven't been all yet. you can eat tacos. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've seen the commercials for it on uh, on CTV, and uh, I yeah. I want to go. Last right. time I was there, I watched our friend Ryan eat fifteen of them. So really, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and that was probably an appetizer for him. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Caraway Grill. Oh, yeah, it says a lot. Oh, I mean, yeah, that it, breaks my heart. Yeah, it's four. I have to put it in four. Yeah, yeah. but it, yeah. it's it's really a one. Yeah. So you've got Zam. Uh, so uh, in your ranking, ginger garlic one. Right. Yeah. Milo is two. Mm-hmm. Zam Zam is three. Yeah. Agave is, f- oh, sorry, Caraway Girl. It, no, Agave is four. Agave, Agave is five. five. Caraway Girl is four. Yeah. Okay. But I would really throw Caraway and Ginger as number ones. Really? Like yeah. a tie? Yeah. Yeah. If anyone hasn't tried them, you got to try them. Nice. Yeah. Ginger yeah. Garlic's a Nepalese restaurant. Yeah. And uh, Caraway, I think, is one of the best Indian restaurants in town. Really? Yeah. Nice. I, I like to venture. Let me rephrase that. I don't like to venture off to like, I like my North American cuisine. Like I'm a meat and potatoes kind of guy. I, yeah. I do enjoy sushi once in a while. <laughs> uh, my wife, Logan loves, um, oh, what's the one in the mall? It's, uh, it, um, I'll think of it here. Oh, it's in the same building as five guys right in the corner there. Nope. What's that producer, Jim? I have to, I have to look it up. Is it Angkor? Angkor. Thank you. Oh yeah. Thank you. Angkor. And I yeah, really enjoy it. It's there. great. Yeah. Uh, it I is there great. last yeah. week actually. Yeah. 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 So it's yeah. not on the list though. So you didn't have to. Yeah. No. Oh. So you're good there. Uh, before we started, I asked you to pick your favorite toy. Yes. You picked a big butt. Just grab it there for me. Instantly. You? Yeah. And you got to be careful because my two year old kind of pick it up right up by the, yeah. I'll, I'll put it in front of the camera here for anybody that's watching can see it's right there. So this is uh, one of a kind. They don't, these are not a production tractor. Um, they're about twice the size of a standard four-wheel drive. Um, it's powered by an 1,100 horsepower, 16-cylinder, 24-liter Detroit diesel. 
And uh, yeah, it's some serious muscle. It's got some, I think these are 1100 metrics on it on, on both sides of, four, of duels. 1400s, yeah. yeah. I think. Are they 1400s? 11, I thought they were 1400s. That could be they wrong. They are 1400s. I stand yeah. corrected. Yeah, yeah, they are 1400s. Anyway, it's just a behemoth. Have we got something pulled up on it there, producer Jim? Yeah, I think, just we, got, to, I think we got it in action here. Oh, I love it. I'm addicted to this kind of stuff. Like the thing is just a monster. <laughs> like, I mean, and, it is, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. And just little chisel plow action there. Those are the legends, those tractors. They are, yeah. The late 70s yeah. and through the 80s when the big horsepower tractors, Big Bud, Steiger. Yeah. You know, and you got a big Roy style. behind you there too, yeah. Yeah, I saw Person that. has got big Roy because, I mean, uh, but yeah, this is just old school engine, engine, steering wheel, uh, gear selector, and, and some hydraulics on it, you know. There's no GPS included in this or no, no option to buy. <laughs> big horsepower. <laughs> Huge yeah. horsepower. And yeah. it's funny, you know, it's kind of a, I don't want to get too into it because we're in our fun segment, but it's a segue into, um, you know, all this uh, deaf stuff and all the environmental, you know, tier emissions compliant stuff mm -hmm. and how before when it was just engine and just raw power that we'd probably burn less fuel because we had the engine power and nothing restricting it. But now we get into this all, you know, D the, you know, using def and, you know, recirculating all that recirculating, um, whatever you call it there. I don't know the terminology cause I yeah. hate the, I hate the shit. Like I hate yeah. it. Like, I mean, you got codes coming up in the middle of winter and it's just like, why do we even have to have this in here? It's a government regulation. So obviously the manufacturers have to build a spec, but yeah, it just, it's, they don't make them like no, they, they, they Those are the good old days. My uncle yeah. actually had a big bud and it was a fun memory as a kid. Um, it was uh, not, definitely not the um, 747 here, but yeah. Um, nevertheless, yeah, big steel and they're super recognizable but with the white, yeah. white color. And um, yeah, they were a thing of folklore when I was growing up, for yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't they're, know what they're, folklore they're, means. They're a rare sight to see now. Oh, yeah. I only think there's one of these, like the 747. As far as I know, yeah. And I think it's in a museum, museum now. in yeah. Iowa or something. Yeah. yeah. Road trip? Road trip. Road trip. Yeah. Wifey's well, yeah. going to stay home for this one. I don't think they're interested <laughs> in going to a museum to see a tractor. <laughs> no. <laughs> right on. Well, Jordan, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for coming on for the first one. This is definitely not going to be your last so, um, yeah, yeah. and uh, until we see each other again, which will be very soon, um, keep having fun at what you're doing. And, uh, yeah, look forward to having you on again. Thanks for having me, John. Real pleasure. All right, man. Take Thanks. care. Thanks.